And we're back with another Kotlin conversation uh, where we're having conversations with just some of the amazing people here at Kotlin Conf 2025. I'm going to it now again, and I'm speaking with Marat. Marat, thank you so much for joining me. Can you tell the audience who happen to know who, uh, who may not know you yet, uh, who are you and what do you do? So I'm currently a researcher at the Kotlin Language Evolution Team. That's the team you have to blame for all of the uh, bad decisions in Kotlin and the team who failed to sabotage all of the good decisions that you have in <laughs> Kotlin language design. Uh, so like I'm also, I hope, relatively known for being one of the people behind the Kotlin language specification. And if you're one of those people, like thank you so much for reading this book that I spent almost two years writing. I also have a long history coming from the research, uh, the computer science research community. I was uh, involved in research around static analysis of programs, uh, Kotlin included. I also was teaching for a very long time, but currently I'm full-time researcher at Kotlin Language Evolution Team. Can I actually thank you for the Kotlin language specification? Because I did, in fact, read it quite a bit for my talk, and I actually quoted from it because I think that it's, it's, it was so fascinating just to kind of hear things kind of spell out in a certain way. Like for example, and this is kind of a weird thing to fangirl on, but I was talking about implicit receivers and I was like, oh, for any call, like for any callable, there might be zero or more uh, implicit receivers available. And just like having that spelled out in such a way like blew my mind. And it actually was a big inspiration for parts of my talk. So I did read it. I love it. Highly recommend. Like, like no, I- and, Thank and you like, so much. This is definitely a Kotlin, a Kotlin conf conference, isn't it? Where it's just like, yes, I'm fangirling. Kotlin language specification is absolutely awesome. So, oh my gosh, I am so happy to get to talk to you about this. Um, but yeah, it's, and, and it really is, I think, valuable to have you know, just have such wonderful, very, uh, I mean, it's it's very dense, right? Because you're writing the language mm -hmm. specification, but I really feel like you wrote it in a way that is just breaking things down. Everything was easily searchable. And I think there's just so much to gain by by having that insight into the work and, and like the, the concepts behind the language we use. So yeah, like definitely, I would hope that Kotlin is a language that you can easily use without having to dive into such yes. kind of like complicated <laughs> material Absolutely. as the proper language specification. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be more of a power user, for example, if you want to like spearhead uh, adoption of Kotlin and you want to understand all the nukes and crannies of how Kotlin actually works, then yeah, you can go to the specification and try to understand why exactly some code behaves uh, the way it does by understanding like what's what what is what is the reasoning what is like the the semantics behind it and for that yeah you can use the specification absolutely you know Colin is easy to use but I think I love it even more now after reading it you know you just like it's just like you start dating someone and like it's all nice you get good vibes but then when you really really get to know them that's when like the love sets in so i feel like you know just reading the language specification i felt even more with Kotlin. so like, thank you for that yeah, dating programming languages is an interesting concept it is i yeah I, I, mm, that could be a talk in and of itself yeah. so I, I was curious Mara, where did you like where did your interest or your kind of work in languages start from so uh, it started again from the beginning of my career mm -hmm. uh, when I was hired in a research lab back in St. Petersburg, uh, doing static analysis of programs. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, to do static analysis on programs, you have to truly and deeply understand the languages in which these programs are written. Sure. And that's how kind of like my need to understand the deeper, again, semantics of how things work within programming languages began. Uh, and then I was doing program analysis for like very long time. And at some point, I think it was like 2017 or 2018, mm -hmm. the Kotlin team reached out to our research lab asking like, hey, we believe that you have the right mix between, between being pragmatic and scientific enough to write us a usable language specification that we can build uh, our transitions uh, between different versions of the compiler on top. Mm -hmm. So that was happening around the period when Kotlin 1.3 and 1.4 happened. And in 1.4, we had our first big shift, which is re-implementation of the type inference. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, and that's why like Y.4 was uh, postponed for like eight months, give or take. We have like an awesome t-shirt at JetBrains that like shows up like all of the release dates crossed, <laughs> crossed out, out yeah. like nope, nope, <laughs> nope, nope. No, okay, this is when we shipped it. Mm. And, uh, and like the specification helped to understand the differences when something didn't work the way it worked before, mm -hmm. which version is correct. 
and why we should or shouldn't fix it. Mm -hmm. And it also greatly helped with it K2, with the 2.0 yeah. release, uh, helping to understand like what is the proper behavior. Like it's not perfect. It has some, again, missing parts and a lot of missing parts actually, mm -hmm. but like it helped with those transitions immensely. Uh, and like once I written the specification, uh, like I kind of got involved with language design in the Kotlin team more and more. And like what I like to say, I by osmosis, I kind of like diffused <laughs> into the Kotlin team team from, from the research side. So like as I was talk, uh, talking with the team and working with the team more and more, mm -hmm. I began being more and more involved in the actual design for an actual programming language. And that became my kind of like new passion. Instead of reasoning about languages and what they do from the static analysis perspective, trying mm -hmm. to design a language uh, which would not require as much additional help from the static analysis, if you will. Excellent. Um, I think it's so fascinating because again, like kind of at the level that you were writing in the language specification feels like I, I'm like transported back to uni to like my, you know, like, you know, deep math and algorithms classes where everything has like a lot of mathematical vigor and there's proofs. But I think it's so fascinating because Kotlin, like from as just an outside user has such great ergonomics and it, like obviously everyone says that it's a joyful experience, like it's a wonderful language. Do you have, do you have any idea, like, is there a connection between the work that you do where, you know, with all that kind of more mathematical, the really scientific, like specific hard, maybe hard thinking, is, is there like, is there like a tangible or an explainable connection between that and just the ergonomics, the joy of a language? Um, I would say that there is a complete lack of connection. That's that. my personal <laughs> opinion. Okay, yeah. Like the thing is that if you want to reason about something, the simpler this thing is, the better. Mm -hmm. So like, okay. e like if, you, if you're doing static analysis, you usually reason about programs not on the way how they're written, but when they're like condensed down to much simpler forms with much less instructions, they have significantly more verbose, mm -hmm. but it's easier to give semantics, and I will be using this this word a lot today, I feel like it's easier to give good semantics, tangible semantics mm -hmm. to five constructions yeah. and then build more complex things from those five you can reason about than when you have to give good semantics to 25 or 40 or 75 language features that are needed for ergonomics because people are writing the programs, mm -hmm. but you have to define each and every one of them. Oh, wow. So okay. like, and from the scientific perspective, you would prefer languages to be very simple, very complex condensed down very verbose, but from the pragmatic perspective, you want the other way around. Mm -hmm. Like the scientific uh, part that cares about ergonomics is like human computer interaction. Yeah. And as far as I understand right now, there is like a big shift into uh, talking more about programming language design and thinking about how languages should look like. Uh, not only because we began caring about that, we, we have been caring about this for a long time, but also because AI is the new infinite consumer for languages and language design. And people began exploring how languages should look like so that AI work with them better. And that's like, that's not even like human computer interaction anymore. That's kind of like computer computer interaction or AI computer interaction. That's, that's an amazing, I hadn't even thought about that is that, you know, I mean, obviously the better data that goes into these models, the pro hopefully the better outcomes or the better data goes in. So I, I never thought about it that way that maybe in the future languages we will be tailored to as you said, computer computer interaction. That's really I, I haven't even thought about that. Like they wouldn't be we hope that they wouldn't be tailored. Yeah. Uh, but because uh, again, a lot of people are saying that and a lot of people in research are showing that things that work for people work for AI. Mm. But as we go forward, we will definitely come up to a point when so in the shift is happening right now. We're seeing that, for example, the more feedback your language, your compiler gives to the uh, to your LLM, yeah. the better because it shortens the feedback loop. Right, and that will I I feel guide design of more languages to have more built-in static checks, mm -hmm. more advanced capabilities. Uh, like in Kotlin, we have like contracts, and we will be extending those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To yeah. give you a better feedback, yeah, uh, like uh, we'll be having immutability that will give you, besides direct benefits from immutability, benefits around concurrency control and concurrency mm -hmm. safety, and like all of the other things. And other languages are also not lagging behind. They are also doing things to give more safety so that LLMs can faster produce code that you can actually use and you, it, it is reliable. 
I, I like that. That's, that I, I think sometimes we have this misapprehension or this mis, uh, misunderstanding that perhaps the LLMs, like the AI, are better at us in certain ways at interpreting things or finding mistakes, but that perhaps just like human beings, if we give them a safer, a safer, more like kind of uh, a safer language, they will inherently create safer or generate safer code. Yeah, that is that is entirely true. At this point, until we haven't reached the AGI or whatever, mm. like at this point, the better your feedback loop for your LLM is, the better it will search through all of the possible programs that solve your prompt and give you a result that you can use. Because again, don't quote me on, on this because like I'm not an ML expert, but like as I understand, LLMs are still, if you like reach to the very core, there are still probabilistic machines yeah. that predict the next token. They do it like very advanced. They have like huge context window that give them a semi-balance of reasoning and mm -hmm. state and intelligence. But in essence, they are still like predictors. They're yeah. still trying, like, trying to search through the possible space of all of the programs if we're using them for code generation. And the better you guide them through this process, mm -hmm. the better you tell them that, no, you shouldn't go there. This is not the right code. You should fix something the faster they will give you results that mm. you can actually use and rely on. I yeah. love that because I think it's a very important thing to emphasize. And I, I've, I, I, the kind of bad way that I've been saying is like, it feels like LLMs are, are like auto, like uh, autocorrect on steroids in a sense. But, 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 and, and that's a little short changing it a bit. But I think that's what's so intriguing is also that a lot of times it's that training process that feels like the long thing or, the, or like, again, as you said, they're more probabilistic machines, right? There's a little, there's a bit of wobble in, in them and sometimes they can be quite non-deterministic. So I love the idea that really we should focus on not necessarily, I don't know, I, I, I'm a li I've, I've always I've been a little bit cautious about this generation of AI, but what has made me feel a little more hopeful is that feedback is that being able to have that shorter feedback cycle with the LLM to like make that model yeah, yeah, like, yeah. get that model understand yeah. like and, and yeah. improve that that the probabilities yeah so. definitely like that's happening with code generation that's happening with like the latest maybe even now not even the latest like approaches when the LLM reason with itself or there's like a another model that critiques the results of the like the main LLM and that's basically the same idea you want to give feedback so that the LLM can search better through the mm -hmm. space of all the possibilities and find the right answer like the most probable answer which is in a lot of domains is the correct one mm -hmm. yeah I like the idea that the LLM is giving itself 360 reviews or something like that. Kind of, kind of, kind of, yeah. Um, I wanted to touch on, because you, you talked about immutability, and I kind of just want to switch gears a little bit. Yeah. And I think it's so fascinating, and um, it's it's something, like, I feel like the concept of immutability, and, and I think I would give Kotlin a lot of credit for this, is that as developers in, like, the Kotlin space, I feel like we're so much more aware of the importance and the power of immutability when we're coding back, back from before days when more object oriented, like, yeah, let's just like bars everywhere. And we just like, you know, we kind of treat things as very much like little state machines. I, I'm kind of curious for you, um, wh what is the state, like just a very broad question, what is the state of immutability and why do you think is important and where, do, where are we going with it as like a, as like an ecosystem, a Kotlin ecosystem? Yeah, so like to correct you a bit, yeah, we actually began, like we began very mutable because we were writing like uh, machine code or assembly, mm -hmm. but then the, like a lot of the first languages that appeared, they were actually super functional. Mm -hmm. They were like immutability through and through. Uh, but then we got back into mutability by default. And now for, I don't know, 10 years, maybe even more, we're slowly going back towards the idea, maybe even like 20 years, we're slowly going back to the idea of, well, actually being immutable by default is the correct choice. Just because like immutable data is much easier to reason about, uh, it avoids a huge cluster of possible errors. Uh, they're just like not possible if, you're, if your data is immutable. Mm -hmm. They give you, uh, like a bit counterintuitively in a lot of cases when you know that something is immutable, it, you cannot write an efficient algorithm. Uh, no, let me rephrase that. You believe that if you were to work with mutable data, you would have written a more performant version of an yes. algorithm or whatever. Yes. But actually, in a lot of cases, if you're working with immutable data, you cannot do this, but the compiler can. 
Mm -hmm. So the compiler, knowing that things are immutable, uh, the compiler has much more opportunities to optimize something. Mm -hmm. And like in a lot of cases, compilers are better than us at optimizing programs. <laughs> so like the current state, uh, to answer like your original question, the current state is that we're going back into understanding that immutability should be in most uh, programming languages by default through and through. Mm -hmm. uh, and languages are trying to to come back to that. A lot of languages just kind of uh, flip their fingers and change the default just because most languages that are used, like Kotlin, they care about backwards compatibility. So Absolutely. we cannot just pull the rug out of people and say like, now you have to rewrite all of your code bases. That's not just gonna work. Mm -hmm. And like, that's why languages go through like the slow and transition period of like reintroducing and like enforcing people, mm -hmm. incentivizing them to use immutability. I, I know, but I love that you pointed that because that, that was my misperception. And that's like something I still feel and even have almost like a, not an emotion, but almost like a reflex, so like, oh, I'm allocating too much. Like, you know, is, is, um, should I just make it one object and say, I'll save memory. But I, and I think that's like a hard, you know, mis, mis, misperception to yeah. get over. And, and like, you're telling me, oh yeah, like they, it, back in the day, it started, everything was immutably was more like prevalent. And I, I think that's, that's a great thing to learn that, hey, it actually was the way we started and it's the way we're going back. And that in fact, it is performant overall, because again, I think day to day, there's I, I feel I feel so many like everyday conversations like no, we shouldn't make another class, and you know, or we should like just go ahead and make it like you know mutable because it's just easier that way. And but it it, it I think it's just it's just a misperception, and I think it's good. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. Again, like like terms and conditions apply because <laughs> because in some domains, in some domains, or in some cases, you actually do properly need mutability. Absolutely, yeah. But like in a lot of cases, uh, you will still get enough performance from working completely immutably but you at the same time gain much more safety. And like, that's the trade-off that, that I can personally take any day of the year. I love it. And um, you know, I know you, gave, you, you, you gave, just gave a talk on immediately and as well, the relationship to Project Valhalla, yeah. which is like the Java, kind of like Java project around uh, immutability and value classes. Um, please check it out. Like if you're interested and you should, I think I, at some point, hopefully, <laughs> I think you should be. I think you should be interested uh, in the, the kind of like the deep, the guts of Kotlin. And it's a really fascinating thing. Uh, read the Kotlin language specification. Uh, watch Marat's talk. And Marat, if people wanted to find you on the internet, how can they do that? So I'm pretty Googleable. So if you <laughs> just do my first name, my last name, put it into Google or whatever other search engine you're using, you should find me as the first or the second link. So like, just do that and... Yeah, you can find me that, like that. All right. Kotlin language specification, bestseller, I swear, just 100%, I swear. Um, but thank you so much for taking time to like, talk to me. Thank you so me. much for having me. All right, and thank you all, and we'll see you.